Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow Masons, it is with great honor and enthusiasm that I welcome you to the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Library Live Lecture Series. This esteemed institution, steeped in the rich traditions of Freemasonry, has been a beacon of knowledge, enlightenment, and fraternity for almost 175 years. Tonight, we gather in the spirit of curiosity and enlightenment to partake in an engaging lecture that promises to broaden our horizons. Tonight with us, we also have some distinguished guests, Right Worshipful Jim Mellis, who is the Secretary of the Trustees of the Library. Jim, say hello. We also have Right Worshipful Clifford Jacobs, past trustee of the library. Cliff, say hello. And to all that are distinguished that I can't see your faces and acknowledge you right now. So the museum has about 37,000 artifacts, 60,000 books, and a Masonic reading course from 1 to 17. We also have digital content on an app called Odillo that you can watch online or on your phone or on a tablet. We also do genealogy requests. We have the American Lodge of Research entire collection and the Oz Quarta Coronatum. We also have almost all of Lodge founding documents. So if you want to do a history of your Lodge, come talk to us. And please come and visit us on the 14th floor. It is a beautiful, beautiful library, museum. <coughs> Please support the library by buying some lapel pins and challenge coins. We have them available tonight. And finally, our live lectures. The past lectures, as well as this one, can be viewed on, on our YouTube channel. Please note, the lectures are the product of our lecturers and do not necessarily represent the views of the library, its staff, or the Grand Lodge of New York. Tonight's lecture is entitled Freemasonry, Fringe Masonry and Ritual Magic. Our lecturer tonight is the author of the three stages of initiatic spirituality, as well as Freemasonry, foundation of the Western esoteric tradition. He is the author of many other books. He is also the editor-in-chief of Fraternal Review and a fellow of the Philades Society. Please help me welcome Brother Angel Malak. Thank you. I'll give you half a hug. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> Thanks very much. I uh, hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, so tonight, yes, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> Freemasonry and occultism. Uh, in particular, I'm going to make the claim that modern occultism, as we understand it, is basically a fusion of um, paramasonic ritual or pseudo-masonic ritual and hypnotism. And uh, we're going to talk first about the ritual element and then about the uh, hypnotism aspect. Uh, I'm going to begin with a uh, quote from Alistair Crowley. Um, as you may know, Alistair Crowley was a poet, painter, uh, boxer, a, mount a mountaineer of some importance, and uh, a novelist, but he was best known almost exclusively known as an occultist and a publicity-seeking uh, magus of the late 19th and early 20th century, who styled himself, probably a little bit unwisely, as the Great Beast 666. Uh, to quote Crowley uh, from his Confessions or Autobiography or Autohagiography, as he called it, uh, quote, I believe that my proposals for reconstituting Freemasonry should prove critically important. Civilization is crumbling under our eyes, and I believe that the best chance of saving what little is worth saving lies with the OTO, unquote. And we'll get to what the OTO is shortly. Uh, Crowley's uh, initiation into magic and occultism began in 1898 uh, in earnest. <coughs> Uh, with his initiation into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in London, uh, actually in Freemasons, uh, in Mark Mason's Hall in London. If you, if you go to London and you visit a Masonic building, you're probably going to go to Freemasons Hall, but there is actually another building called uh, Mark Mason's Hall, which is where all of the higher degrees, quote unquote, higher. Uh, degrees such as the Scottish Rite are held, and that is where, in a hired room, he was initiated into the Golden Dawn. Uh, the Golden Dawn, or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, focused on the Kabbalah, originally a Jewish theosophical system, 
of the medieval period, uh, which was later taken over by Christian theologians, at first to try and convince Jews to convert to Christianity. Uh, later became infused with Hermeticism and uh, later became a sort of purely New Age occult uh, phenomenon. And today you can get books such as uh, Kabbalah for Wiccans, Wiccans be Wicca being a type of uh, neo-paganism. Uh, so quite a journey for the Kabbalah. But uh, the Golden Dawn itself was founded by William Wynne Westcott, uh, Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, and uh, William Robert Woodman. And uh, Woodman and uh, Westcott have both been the Supreme Magus uh, for the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia. And that society was only open and still is only open to regular Freemasons. Uh, it, in a sense, teaches elements of Kabbalah, alchemy, Hermeticism, and uh, so on. Uh, so it's, in a sense, quite outside of regular craft Freemasonry, but you have to be a regular Mason to be a member of the Societas Rosicruciana. Uh, in, the, in 1900, the history of the Societas Rosicruciana was published. It was uh, written by uh, Wynne Westcott, and um, notably in it, he mentions the Golden Dawn, and he actually mentions that Mathers is a, quote, very famous occult student, unquote, unquote uh, and mentions Mathers interested on practice in tarot and Kabbalah. Uh, and he also says, quote, in association with uh, Dr. Wynne Westcott and Dr. W Woodman, he, Mathers, founded the Isis Urania Temple of the Golden Dawn, and he is now the chief adept of the entirely esoteric order of the RR at AC in France, Great Britain, and other countries." Unquote. And the RR at AC is the uh, Rosé Rubé et Ore Crucis, or the Ruby Rose and Golden Cross. And um, we'll look at orders and lineages later on, but the uh, Ruby Rose and Golden Cross is, um, is very much influenced by the Golden Rosy Cross of the 18th century, which was also only open to Freemasons. Uh, Westcott, it should be said, uh, uh, noted that the Societas Rosicruciana was only open to Christians at the time, although he said, in quotes, not of an orthodox type necessarily. Um, as I say, it was much more focused, it really is entirely focused on Kabbalah, uh, Hermeticism, and Christianity at, at least officially is not really a part of it. So, The occult world of the early 20th century and before that is a pretty small world and people tend to know each other. Uh, here we have Alistair Crowley. You might notice that he is wearing Masonic regalia or a Scottish Rite Masonic regalia. By him is Theodore Royce, also in uh, Masonic regalia, Craft Masonic. And there in the middle is Karl Kauner. Uh, Royce and Kauner founded the Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, this was a, originally intended to be a, uh, an ac Academia Masonica, or a sort of collection of different Masonic rites. Uh, Royce had been initiated into Freemasonry in London, actually in, uh, in Pilgrim Lodge in London in 1877, and Kauner had been initiated in Germany in 1873. Uh, one thing uh, we might uh, know at this point is that Westcott, William Wynne Westcott, had been a member and was actually highly placed in the so-called Swedenborgian rite of Freemasonry. And that today, that rite is very, very obscure. Uh, I know that some of these obscure rites are being revived in Great Britain, uh, but to all intents and purposes, it, is, it died out quite a while ago. Uh, it's a 19th century Masonic rite based on, um, based on the teachings of the uh, Christian mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. 
who claimed that angels visited him and uh, gave him the esoteric meaning of every passage of the Bible. And there's actually a Swedenborgian church in New York, and it was founded uh, in New York originally, that, that particular religion, uh, although it is based, as I say, on the works of the Swedish um, mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, so uh, William Wynne Westcott gave uh, Royce here a charter for the Swedenborgian rite, and he also gave him a charter for the Societas Rosicruciana, uh, to be known as the Societas Rosicruciana in Germania or in Germany, as opposed to in Anglia, in England. Um, in 1917, the Ordo, the Ordo Templi Orientis was uh, announced as having uh, been founded on several different charters of different organizations, uh, many of them Masonic. Uh, among them, uh, as we see in the 1970 edition of Oriflama, which was Royce's journal for the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, according to that issue, the OTO is founded on uh, the Order of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, the Holy Order of the Rose Croix of Hiridum, the Order of the Holy Royal Arch of Enoch, the Ancient and Primitive Rite of Masonry, 33 degrees, the Rite of Memphis, 97 degrees, the Rite of Mizraim, 90 degrees, the Ancient and, and Accepted Scottish Rite of Masonry, 33 degrees, and the Swedenborgian Rite of Masonry, uh, plus some other orders such as the Order of Martinists, which aren't technically Masonic. But all of the uh, orders that I just mentioned are Masonic in one way or another, uh, whether considered to be uh, regular or clandestine, uh, they would all regard themselves as Masonic. Uh, although, as I mentioned, Arif Lama was the a journal uh, which announced the existence of the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, originally a, a Academia Masonica, but really today is regarded as a kind of Western esoteric or occult society, and most notorious or known for uh, having teachings of uh, sexual magic once you get to a certain degree. Um, nevertheless, uh, as you, you might be able to see, maybe not, but this is an early edition, 1902, Arif Lama, and yet it says here it is the organ for high-grade Freemasonry. Uh, specifically mentioned is the Swedenborgian Rite and the Order of the Rosenkruze or Rosicrucians. Uh, there's no mention of the OTO at that point. Uh, so Crowley begins to come back into the picture in regard to Freemasonry around, nine, around 1900, just a few years really before the Ordo Templi Orientis gets going. Uh, he was in Mexico City at that, at that time and was initiated into a Scottish rite of Freemasonry. Um, Scottish rite, for those who don't know, is regarded as being additional degrees or higher degrees than that of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason, which in America constitute craft Freemasonry or Freemasonry proper. In Great Britain, they would also uh, include the Royal Arch as well. But um, the, the Scottish Rite is just one rite or order that extends beyond it. Uh, many members that are in it would say it's higher. Officially, it's just additional degrees that you can take if you want, or you don't have to. Uh, Crowley's Scottish Rite that he joined uh, turned out to be clandestine, meaning that it was not recognized by regular Masonic bodies, uh, regular Masonic jurisdictions, um, such as uh, the ones that, that meet here in this building, uh, meaning that Crowley could not have, for example, gone to a Scottish Rite meeting in a regular large, say, in New York or London uh, or anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> a few years later, in 1904, he joined Anglo-Saxon Lodge in Paris. Uh, this was a craft Masonic Lodge and an apprentice fellow craft master mason. But um, this too turned out to be irregular or clandestine uh, and unrecognized by lodges under the United Grand Lodge of England, although he claims that there were uh, high up members of the UGLE 
in Anglo-Saxon Lodge. Uh, Crowley uh, was uh, disturbed, uh, maybe enthusiastic enough about Freemasonry and disturbed enough to discover that his Lodge and his Scottish Rite were both clandestine, to actually write in the English Review complaining about uh, the issue of regularity and that it was basically unfair that some lodges were regarded as clandestine, even though the members would have gone through all of the same rituals and received all of the same secrets and did all of the same sort of minor opening and closing rituals that you would expect to find in a regular lodge and probably had similar, if not in some cases, identical views. Uh, in 1912, uh, having been initiated into irregular or clandestine Freemasonry, having been initiated into the Golden Dawn, uh, he was uh, made head of the Ordo Templi Orientis for Great Britain and Ireland. Uh, that section was named the Mysteria Mystica Maxima. And uh, at that point in 1912, Crowley began writing rituals for his section based on the emulation rite of Freemasonry. And the emulation rite is essentially the most standard, uh, standard form of ritual in Freemasonry in London, as I understand it, in the same way that in America and in, in New York, uh, our ritual is based on the York rite or it's York rite ritual. Um, so he began writing rituals based on the emulation rite of Freemasonry for the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, which certainly would have made it uh, clandestine at that point, conferring Masonic secrets. Uh, Crowley, however, wanted to shorten the rituals, uh, not unsurprisingly, as, as I mentioned, uh, the Ordo Templi Orientis was based on such rites as the Rite of Memphis and the Rite of Mizraim and the Rite of Memphis and Mizraim, whose degrees could run into the 90s. Uh, in the same year, uh, Crowley's book, The Book of Lies, was published, 1912, as I say. Uh, in there, <clears throat> we find a poem called Lambskin. And um, as every Freemason here will realize lambskin is a reference to the Masonic apron, and uh, it is filled with Masonic symbolism. Um, I'm going to read the poem. It's short. Uh, it's maybe, maybe not the best poem in the world, but it gives a kind of sense of what's going on in Crowley's mind at this time. Lambskin. Cowan, skidoo, tile, swear to heal all. This is the mystery, life. Mind is the traitor, slay mind. Let the corpse of mind lie unburied on the edge of the great sea, death. This is the mystery, tile, cowan, skidoo. So uh, a few of those words are a little bit obscure uh, for non-Masons especially. Uh, cowan, skidoo, tile, heal. I'm going to briefly touch on what they mean. Cowan, cowan is a, uh, so medi well, sort of old Scottish word, dates from around the 1500s, and it refers to someone who has the ability to make uh, a dry stone wall, but doesn't possess the ability to make mortar. So in a sense, someone who has the sort of ambition to be something like a stonemason, but doesn't possess the trade secrets of stonemasonry, being able to make mortar being probably the most important, or one of the most important. So that's Cowan. Skidoo, uh, I don't know if you know, but um, around the early 20th century, people would hang out on 23rd Street, where we are now, and the police would drive past and say, 23 skidoo, it means, so in that case, get away. So it actually pertains to where we are right now, historically. So Cowan skidoo, tile. So tile, if you go to a Masonic lodge, a lodge will be tiled, meaning there will be an officer outside the lodge with a sword protecting the lodge from uh, Cowans, which in a Masonic sense means someone who wants to possess the secrets of Freemasonry, of course. Of course. A tile, because uh, well, a, tile, a tile is square, so we might think of it as sealing off the room. Tiles are maybe laid on the floor. Tile is probably related to the 47 proposition as well, which is used to map out the first corner of any building, um, at least up until very recently. Uh, we may have m new technology 
at this point. But traditionally, that was the case. Uh, heal, so if a lodge is clandestine, it can be healed. Heal is H-E-L-E. Uh, and it can be made reg regular, depending if it has a fairly legitimate history and is doing everything um, that, it should, that is regarded as it should be doing. It can be healed and made regular. Uh, so, Kaun Skidu, Tile, Swear to Heal All. This is the mystery. Life, mind is the traitor, slay mind. Let the corpse of mind lie unburied on the edge of the great sea. And that last line seems to refer to a Masonic symbolic penalty. But what you may notice is that he's essentially taking sort of Eastern mysticism. Uh, the mind is plagued by these Cowans that we must say skidoo to, and uh, we must uh, keep this trader of the mind at bay to experience some kind of blissful and you know, death-like experience where, where there's no ego. Uh, it seems to be what he's saying. So around the same time, uh, around the time that he was writing poetry and uh, writing rituals based on the emulation, right, uh, he came across a Detroit Mason called Albert Ryerson, who was a bookseller and also a 32-degree deg uh, Scottish right Freemason in Detroit. And Ryerson wanted to sell Crowley's books. Uh, he was interested in the occult, the New Age. Uh, but he also wanted to get a hold of the Ordo Templi Orientis and make it an official Masonic rite so that you would go through the Scottish rite and then after that you would go through the Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, understandably, Crowley was actually quite enthusiastic about this. Um, Crowley's following was always small and uh, although he started out life with a large inheritance, he ended up quite poor. Uh, I'm not making a moral judgment about that. He did what he wanted to do, and he traveled around the world and practiced magic and did everything uh, with great seriousness. But uh, at some point, he was going to need some sort of income, and the OTO membership wasn't going to provide it. Um, uh, Crowley, uh, Crowley being asked, was asked to rework the rituals of the OTO based on the emulation right. They were far too close to regular craft Freemasonry. And being so, that, that would make them clandestine. And if any regular Freemason joined the OTO at that point, uh, they would have been committing um, uh, uh, an infraction and could have been uh, kicked out of Freemasonry. So they had to be rewritten. Uh, uh, Crowley, um, and I should probably say this comes from an article by Richard Kaczynski in the Fraternal Review of last year, uh, Crowley wrote to Ch uh, Charles Stanfield Jones uh, saying, quote, I am then determined to revise the rituals of the OTO in such sense that they will not conflict in any way with Masonic ideals, unquote. So we've seen, oh, and this is actually a, um, an application by Ryerson to join the Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, you might notice the insignia issued by the Order of the OTO on your right and uh, signature and then here he is uh, crossed out where it says i swear in the presence of the great architect of the universe by the volume of the sacred law that i have not at any time been initiated into freemasonry and he's crossed it out of course because he has been but it's slightly ironic that it's using masonic terminology to say that you haven't been initiated into freemasonry so So at this point, we can see that there's an awful lot of overlap between, if not Freemasonry and occultism, then Freemasons and occultism. The Golden Dawn founded by members of the Society of Torres Cruciana and Freemasons, and uh, the Ordo Templi Orientis originally being an uh, Academia Masonica, and really founded to be a sort of collection of all of these different Masonic rites. Uh, is, th is this a coincidence? Um, well, I'm going, to read, uh, I'm going to read a quote from Gotthold Lessing's Ernst and Falk. Gotthold Lessing was a, uh, a playwright in Germany uh, of, in, during the 18th century, a uh, friend of Wolfgang von Goethe, uh, their best-known playwright, uh, sort of Germany's Shakespeare. Uh, he was a friend of Goethe's. Goethe was also a Freemason, it should be said. Uh, and he wrote uh, anonymously a work called uh, Ernst and Falk. And I'll just read, I'll read a read paragraph or two, just to give you a sense of 18th century Freemasonry in, in, that, 
in that place and time. Uh, quote, Falk, whether it is really possible to manufacture gold or not is all the same to me, but I am quite convinced that intelligent men will wish to be able to manufacture it only with respect to Freemasonry. Also, the first person to whom the Philosopher's Stone will be vouchsafed will in the same instant become a Freemason, and it is nonetheless remarkable that all reports which the world tells of real or supposed gold manufacturers confirm this. Ernst, and those who conjure up spirits, folk, the, the same applies to, practically to them. Spirits cannot possibly listen to the voice of any other person than a Freemason, unquote. So alchemy, conjuring up spirits, it doesn't necessarily sound like your average lodge. But when we look at the 18th century and what's going on, uh, we see this sort of explosion of Masonic rites and quote-unquote Masonic orders once Freemasonry gets to France and Germany in particular. And here are just a few of the rites that emerge uh, on the left uh, during the 18th century or degrees as well. Scots Masonry, fourth degree, we don't really know much about it or anything, <clears throat> but it seems to be uh, the Royal Arch degree uh, under another name. Um, you, I'd say it's the fourth degree in Germany. Uh, you had to take the fourth degree to, to join, for example, the Order of the Golden Rosicrucians. So you had to be a Scottish master. When that disappeared, you get the emergence of the Holy Royal Arch or the Royal Arch degree, which I say in England is regarded as really the completion of craft masonry. Uh, you have strict observance appearing, which was the most powerful, uh, quote unquote, Masonic rite in Germany uh, for a sizable amount of time during the 18th century. Uh, it claimed to descend from the actual historical Knights Templars. Uh, you have the Asiatic Brethren, uh, they were busy translating uh, Jewish Kabbalistic texts and conferring Kabbalistic secrets to their uh, initiates. Uh, you have the Egyptian rite of Freemasonry, which isn't really Egyptian, but uh, would teach sort of Rosicrucian and Hermetic um, uh, secrets. The Elucoen, or the Order of Night Masons, elect priests of the universe. Um, sort of battling against the dark forces of modernity and trying to repair the relationship with Jesus, uh, maybe with some sort of ecstatic visionary experiences. Uh, the rectified Scottish rite, uh, we'll come to that a little later, and the Order of the Golden Rosy Cross, uh, which was involved in, um, in alchemy, in uh, raising spirits with the aid of a ghost raising machine, and uh, indeed, uh, claim to possess the elixir of life. Uh, as the name of the order suggests, it was a self-styled Rosicrucian order, but um, it insisted that uh, the initiates be uh, Freemasons and uh, Scottish master or fourth degree Freemasons to be el eligible to join. So we're going to look at uh, magnetism. I mentioned that modern occultism is basically, in my opinion, a fusion of uh, paramasonic ritual and hypnotism, at least in its sort of foundation. Um, so if you, if we um, look at contemporary 20th century, 21st century books on the occult. Uh, you'll notice that there's quite often um, a, far, a fairly large emphasis on Hindu, Buddhist, or Eastern meditation. And uh, you might wonder why uh, it is that you should be practicing Eastern meditation uh, before doing magic. Uh, Crowley, in his Magic and Theory of 1929, for example, uh, dedicates an in entire chapter to uh, Hindu, Buddhist meditation and yoga uh, and so on. Um, and today, of course, you can get books such as The Wiser Concise Guide to Yoga for Magic and even Magic from the Mat, Using Yoga to Enhance Your Witchcraft. And so why, why are modern occultists uh, concerned with yoga and Eastern meditation? Uh, well, Crowley sort of probably set this off with magic and theory and practice, at least to a large degree. 
Uh, Arthur Avalon had also introduced some elements of uh, Eastern meditation to the English-speaking world as well. But I'm going to re read uh, another short passage from another poem by Crowley called Pentecost uh, from his Sword of Song, 1904. Uh, quote, You weary me with proof enough that all this meditation stuff is self-hypnosis, be it so. Do you suppose I did not know? Unquote. And uh, so Crowley is basically saying, yes, all of this Eastern meditation stuff, which he learned in the Himalayas uh, firsthand, is really just another form of uh, self-hypnosis. So what role did hypnosis play in the occult world prior to this, since it seems to be replacing it? Well, uh, Madame Helena Blavatsky, the founder of the Theosophical Society, um, the Theosophical Society, of course, is a now a very obscure and mostly unknown society. Uh, it still exists. You can go and visit it on the, in the 50s here, 51st Street. But um, it was an enormously influential society during its day, not only on occultism, but also on the culture. Um, it may be particularly in India, when Blavatsky and her, her entourage went to India, they became involved in sort of anti-colonial politics, uh, the same in Sri Lanka as well. And, um, you know, it really probably can't be uh, overstated their importance. But, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma is a, uh, is a, is a title, not, not a name. His name is Mohandas, of course. Uh, and his title, you would think, would have been given to him by some Hindu sage, but it was actually given to him by theosophists. It means great soul. But um, Blavatsky says uh, in her tome, Isis Unveiled, quote, mesmerism is the most important branch of magic and its phenomena are the effects of the universal agent uh, which underlies all magic and has produced at all ages the so-called miracles, unquote. So mesmer mesmerism is the foundation of magic. Uh, mesmerism, or sometimes called magnetism, uh, goes back to the hypnotist, or you might say healer, Franz Anton Mesmer. Uh, we'll get to him in a second. But uh, also Papu or Pappus or Gerard Ancus, uh, a medical hypnotist by profession and um, scholar of the occult, an occult practitioner, founder of the Kabbalistic Order of the Rose Croix, or co-founder and founder of the Order, uh, First Martinist Order, uh, also says something very similar to Blavatsky. And he says uh, uh, in his elementary treatise on magic, quote, magnetism is connected with procedures currently used by village sorcerers and by all those who pass more or less for adepts of magic, unquote. And uh, it should be said that he doesn't think that magnetism or mesmerism or hypnotism alone constitutes magic. Uh, he, he thinks of magic as a kind of fusion of herbalism, astrology, evocations of spirits, and hypnotism as well. But it's an important ingredient for both of these two. Uh, once very influential figures in the occult world. So Franz Anton Mesmer uh, was born in what is now Austria and uh, moved to Paris where he became a celebrity holding uh, quote-unquote seances or sittings. Uh, of course, the word seance was taken up into spiritualist circles later on. Uh, and he would, uh, he would throw people into trances and uh, heal them through his own hypnotic method. Uh, in contrast to what we think of as hypnotism of, you know, a swinging watch or somebody speaking to you and putting you into a hypnotic state, uh, he believed that human beings were suffused and surrounded by a kind of fluid or energy and that he was able to manipulate this fluid and by doing so he could throw someone into a trance and heal them. And uh, if you see... <laughs> illustrations of uh, Mesmer's sayings, uh, they, of, of seances, uh, they look absolutely chaotic. People falling over, people sleepwalking. It looks like a state of anarchy from all of the contemporary descriptions. Uh, here he's throwing this woman into a magnetic trance, manipulating this fluid. Um, this, this sounds like Reiki to us today. It may sound like some other forms of healing as well. But uh, at that time, late 18th century, it also could, 
could be construed as being somewhat scientific. Uh, of course, uh, Benjamin Franklin had been experimenting with electricity, which was an invisible force that people were now beginning to understand. Um, so Isaac Newton had, had persuaded people that there was another invisible force called gravity. <coughs> And uh, later in the, in the uh, 18th century, uh, the first experiment, lifting someone into, uh, into the air with, uh, in a hot air balloon uh, also took place. And hot air was another sort of miraculous, invisible force. I'm not the first person to make that connection, by the way. But um, so all of these invisible forces seem to be everywhere. And uh, so in a sense, Mesmer's animal magnetism or magnetism and healing through this invisible fluid seems to be kind of in keeping with at least scientific discoveries. Not, I would say, with rationalism. And I would point out that Freemasonry and secret societies are very much in opposition to rationalism uh, and the idea that everything can be solved through rational thinking and open, an open sort of non-secret uh, ways of thinking. But um, why, is, uh, why is Mesmer important to the occult world? Besides the fact that it sort of continues to be an influence in some spheres, uh, there are a few figures that connect with Mesmer that are important. Uh, one of those is Saint Martin. I mentioned um, that uh, Papu was the founder of the first Martinist order and that the Ordo Templi Orientis uh, also claimed uh, to be founded on the charters and legitimacy and uh, heritage of uh, other orders, one of them being uh, the Martinist order. Uh, the sort of intellectual grandfather of Martinism, uh, which today is a sort of initiate, initiatic school, rather like Freemasonry, um, the in intellectual founder was Louis-Claude de Saint-Martin, uh, and he was the 27th member of... Um, uh, Mesmer's uh, society, uh, the uh, Society of Harmony in Paris, uh, and he joined in 1784, uh, the 27th member. Uh, why, why would Saint Martin be interested in this sort of in manipulation of fluid and throwing people into trances? Uh, he had been a member of the Alu Cohen, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, was involved you know, partly in sort of battling demonic forces that were bringing in modernity and partly with this idea of, uh, of the repair of Jesus that you have some sort of vision of. There were probably some sort of visionary ecstatic uh, states and work in that order. Uh, and uh, the spirits, I should say, were called astral intelligences in the Aluk Hoen. But um, so you can see why, why people involved in the occult or interested in spirits would be curious about Mesmer's methods of entering some kind of trance or manipulating these invisible forces. Uh, Saint Martin, it should be said, eventually became suspicious of Mesmer, or at least his practices, and uh, felt that it was exposing people to the dangers of astral intelligences. Uh, another figure, probably the most important figure for Freemasonry is Jean-Baptiste Willemotes, uh, 1730 to 1824. Uh, he, he founded the uh, Knights Beneficent of the Holy City, uh, which is uh, an invitational body you can join if you go all the way through the York Rite degrees, through the Royal Arch, through the, uh, uh, the, the Order of the Temple, and so on. Uh, you may, maybe one day you'll get an invitation. But he founded that uh, that order uh, to diffuse uh, the teachings of the Lu Koen after it had basically collapsed. He's better known, however, as the creator of the Rose Qua degree. Uh, the Rose Qua in regular Freemasonry, uh, of course, is the 18th degree of the Scottish Rite, but Earlier in time, pretty much every Masonic and Paramasonic order had a Rose Qua degree. So even Knights Templar encampments, Masonic Knights Templar encampments, uh, had, uh, would confer the Rose degree at one point, and then they had to surrender that uh, to be sort of mutually recognized by the Scottish Rite. But uh, Jean-Baptiste Willemot, the uh, creator of the Rose Qua degree and the founder of the CBCS, 
or the uh, Knights Beneficent of the Holy City. Uh, introduced uh, mesmerism to lodges in Lyon. So they were practicing mesmerism inside the Masonic lodges. And uh, Mesmer's um, society was also populated in that area by Freemasons. Uh, and again, you can see why they would want to do that because this mesmeric method of trance sort of may open you up to some sort of astral intelligences or some sort of revelation about the spiritual nature of being. Um, so again, you can see Mesmer is manipulating this astral fluid. So if we move through to the 20th century, uh, we're going to look at the Fraternitas Saturni uh, very briefly. Uh, the Fraternitas Saturni uh, was founded at around 1926. Uh, it is most certainly a was called a left-hand path, a cold order. Um, so the, the Golden Dawn would be much more focused on the light. Um, parts of it would be semi-Christian, it's inner order, Rosicrucian order, would have Christian symbolism to a certain degree. Uh, the Fraternitas Saturni uh, was more interested in the symbolism of Saturn. And I think we know that Saturn is generally um, associated with the dark. Although the actual god Saturn was originally regarded as the god of the golden age and only later became this sort of dark figure. Um, noticeably, the uh, Fraternitas Saturni is 33 degrees. They are, uh, that's structured after the Scottish Rite, although the degrees are themselves totally different and not related to Freemasonry as such, although the structure is based on the Scottish Rite. Uh, here, here we see a ritual in which uh, a spirit is being made, or astral procreation, uh, rather like Mesmer, uh, manipulating this fluid. Uh, the male magician who is sitting, you may notice, in a sort of Eastern meditational posture, um, uh, is manipulating the astral fluid or the mesmeric fluid uh, through what's called magnetic passes. Uh, a term that's taken directly from uh, Mesmer's uh, practice, using magnet magnetic passes to manipulate the fluid and to pass it through his own body and to project it into this sigil on the floor. So again, we see this sort of fusion to some degree of Freemasonry with this degree structure based on the Scottish Rite, and then this magnetic passes and mesmerism as well. Uh, another place where you'll find uh, mesmerism uh, a lot is in Willie Schroeder's uh, Rosicrucian Notebook. Uh, it really saturates that book. But uh, as you can probably guess, uh, Fraternitas Saturni is a German occult order. Uh, and in Germany, uh, Mesmer has remained uh, much more well known uh, and his influence uh, is still felt, uh, unlike the English-speaking world. Uh, this is actually on the right, or on your, your right, uh, you will see a Fraternitas Saturni tapis or carpet from 1951. On the left is an illustration in three, in an expose called Three Distinct Knocks, uh, published in uh, 1760. Uh, this, this is a description or an illustration of the Masonic Lodge. Uh, you can see apprentice step, crafts step, master step. Uh, so this represents the Masonic Lodge. Uh, you may notice that the Fraternitas Saturni uh, carpet from two centuries later is clearly based on the Masonic. And, you know, there were more elaborate versions of this. This is really the first one. Uh, if you look at the symbolism on the Fraternitas Saturni carpet, you can see the Masonic square and compasses at the top. Uh, you have a Star of David or Blazing Star. Uh, at the very top, uh, you have a letter G, which we find in Freemasonry. Uh, under the triangle, either side, you have uh, two pillars represented by those two circles. Uh, and again, in the middle, you have a pentagram, also associated to some degree with uh, British Freemasonry. Uh, the most unusual elements that you wouldn't find in Freemasonry are the, the, the tor in the center, the T-shape, and uh, the... Uh, in the center, there's also a, a sigil of Saturn uh, in, the, in that 
arrangement of three circles is the top one. And you wouldn't find a, a sigil of Saturn in Freemasonry. But it's pretty clear that even, uh, even well into uh, the Fraternitas Saturni's history, it's drawing pretty significantly, at least in some ways, from Freemasonry, as well as from Mesmer, and uh, as well as from uh, Eastern meditation as well, even. So throughout the 20th century, at least for the first three, uh, three quarters of that century, uh, occultism in the West was really dominated by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, or at least its offshoots, and the Ordo Templi Orientis, uh, with some breakaway, uh, some, let's say, a conflict within that world with a Typhonian Ordo Templi or Orientis in Great Britain, which later became the uh, Typhonian Order, and a, uh, another uh, competing order, uh, or Ordo Templi Orientis in America, which eventually became recognized as the kind of official, uh, official OTO uh, with a legitimate history. Uh, but during the 1970s, of course, the world is changing. You have a high unemployment, riots, strikes in Great Britain. Uh, you have punk rock, of course, and uh, there's really not much appetite for sort of Victorian and Edwardian uh, ritual, ceremonial magic, and you start to get other things besides Wicca, which we'll look at briefly. Uh, and the most important uh, movement of that time uh, was chaos magic, or at least the beginnings of chaos magic. Uh, this is uh, Libano and Psychonaut, uh, Peter J. Carroll's first two books that were repackaged later on as one book. And uh, he was really uh, other figures may have been involved, but he was really the person who founded chaos magic in a significant way. Chaos magic was a rejection of all of the ceremonial magic, but it was also um, it would also do things like rituals to cartoon characters, or try and do things that were sort of mentally unexpected, or you were supposed to play with beliefs and not have any beliefs. So you could you could one week you could say I'm going to be a Wiccan, and then the next week, you could say, I'm going to be a fundamentalist Christian for a month. And then a month after that, you could be a, a Druid or a Muslim or an atheist. You were supposed to play with these quote unquote paradigms. So um, it was quite, uh, I mean, from that, you can tell it's quite chaotic, although uh, he does give specific practices in his, his book. What's interesting about this is that in uh, Lebanon and Psychonaut, despite all of the rejection of the Ordo Templi Orientis and Golden Dawn and ceremonial magic and having to learn your lines and stuff like that, uh, we can see that there is a supposed uh, lineage mapped out for the, order, uh, for the Illuminates of Nataros, uh, which was the sort of premier chaos magic group in Great Britain, spread to California and New York and elsewhere, um, uh, which was founded by Peter J. Carroll. And if we look, we can see it goes from shamanism through Tantra, Sufism, medieval, Goetia, and from there we get right in the middle, uh, Freemasonry again, as if it cannot be escaped, even in chaos magic and the rejection of all this stuff. And then finally, you through Alistair Crowley, you get down to the IOT. And there are other things as well, but I think it's, it's kind of telling that Freemasonry is literally right in the center of that that diagram. I believe he's actually reworked it um, for his latest edition, uh, so that might not be in there anymore, but this was what was believed at one point. So you can't escape it. So you know, as, as I mentioned, you get Wicca, which is a neo-paganism, neo uh, neo-pagan uh, religion and it's sort of initiatic uh, system. It too borrowed from Freemasonry. It has three degrees like craft Freemasonry. It calls itself the craft or the craft of the wise, just as uh, Freemasons refer to the craft or the craft lodge or the craft degrees. And it uses some Masonic terminology, such, such as the five points of fellowship, that though, though they are different in Freemasonry and Wicca. And of course, they use the term Cowan. Uh, Cowan probably uh, via uh, Alistair Crowley and his, uh, his poem, Lambskin. Um, certainly not from the 1500s, but from Freemasonry via Crowley into Wicca. So some of the terminology 
uh, wicker borrow from Freemasonry. Um, you may argue that the, the uh, pentagram as well has connections to Freemasonry as well as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. But uh, later, later uh, by the time we're getting to the end of the 20th century, there's an interest in runes. Now there's a really big interest in this sort of thing because of the Vikings TV show. And um, an old theories saying that Freemasonry derives from the Vikings sort of making the round on social media. Uh, I can tell you it's not correct. But, uh, and I think I know something about both of those worlds. But, um, you know, the, we, we can go back to Freemasonry and runes before this, but probably the biggest thing, at least in the hundred, last 150 years, for runes, um, although a highly controversial figure, was uh, Guido von Licht. Um, he, he was a, a writer, a journalist, an eccentric, uh, who was interested in, he was Austrian, interested in Austria and Germany's so ancient past. And then around, uh, around the turn of the century, uh, he lost his sight for several weeks. And during this period, uh, he claimed to have a vision, a vision of the runes. Um, the runes, uh, I should say, most, most people consider them to be symbols to do with divination. They are, they are more properly uh, letters in, an, in alphabets different, with different uh, numbers of letters. It varies from time and place. Uh, well, each of these letters have meaning. Um, they have poems about the meanings. So it's not entirely clear cut. Uh, it's not that they're entirely secular and have no symbolic reference. Uh, New Age tends to get a little bit carried away with what they might be, though. But anyway, so Guido von Liszt had a, uh, had a vision of the runes. Uh, his runes were unlike any others. Well, they were very similar, but he had a different number and um, applied different meanings to them to a certain degree. Uh, this is from his book, The Secrets of the Runes, uh, published in the early, early 20th century. Uh, this, this image is really meant to be telling us that the runes are disguised in heraldic devices. He would also say that they are disguised in the timber of traditional German houses and German, the traditional German buildings as well, or they're disguised in the windows of cathedrals. Uh, so that's what's going on here. What you might notice is right in the corner there, there is a Masonic square and compasses with the three lesser lights that you will find in a Masonic lodge. It's basically a Masonic altar. So even, even here in this sort of visionary world of runes and paganism, Freemasonry is still emerging to some degree. And uh, von Liszt, I should say, had a, had a conception that in antiquity, in the pagan past or pre-Christian past, that there was a guild of rune masters that had three degrees. Uh, and this, of course, is influenced by what he saw in Freemasonry with three craft degrees. Um, actually, there were theories about uh, runes and Freemasonry and Vikings and Freemasonry before that. A, a, a New Jersey senator called George F. Fort claimed that, uh, free, that Freemasonry uh, came from uh, Viking temples. Um, I don't think it's really credible, though it, it's kind of cool if, you don't, you know, if you're not too interested in the history. Uh, just to recap then, so we saw that the, the Golden Dawn and the uh, Ordo Templi Orientis, two, two of the most important occult orders of the last century or so, emerged out of the Swedenborgian Rite and the Societas Rosicruciana, which themselves were sort of emerged for a long history from these 18th century uh, rites of Freemasonry, the strict observance, which said it came from the Knights Templar or the Golden Rosicrucians who were practicing alchemy, spirit raising, and so on. Um, this world of ritual and alchemy and mysticism uh, blended with uh, hypnotism, especially uh, the work of Franz Anton Mesmer, and particularly through Willemotz and the Rose Croix, and his, uh, his uh, groups of uh, Leon Masons, and this was later replaced by Eastern meditation. Um, so I, I'm just going to wrap up by saying that 
although there's been an enormous influence of Freemasonry on occultism, and in fact, if it wasn't for Freemasonry, um, the modern occult world would be absolutely unrecognizable. Uh, even so, I don't think that Freemasonry is occult. I would say that it is uh, initi an initiatic order, uh, the likes of which go back into antiquity. Uh, certainly, Freemasonry has roots, probably going back 600 years, at least, let's say, proto-Masonry. And I think we can extend it back even further, though it would have changed enormously and unrecognizably over that time. But I'll just end with this quote by um, Chris Kershaw, uh, who's an academic who studies pagan or pre-Christian symbolism, particularly of India and Northern Europe. Uh, in his book, The One-Eyed God, Odin and the Indo-Germanic Manabund, uh, he says that the Manabund, which means male initi initiatic society, quote, disappeared with, if not before, the eradication of pagan worship but exclusive men's societies of other sorts, most notably the guilds, sprang up to fill the void, unquote. Um, and the most important guild would have been stonemasonry, uh, out of which Freemasonry would emerge about a millennia later. Well, with that, thanks very much. Thank you so much, brother. Now comes time for questions. Just raise your hand, I'll come over to you. Even though you don't need the microphone for the room, we do need it for the video. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Brother Angel? I got it. Oh, good. What was so significant about the early 20th century, right around the First World War, before the First World yeah. War, during the First World War and after, that stimulated all this kind of cult connections and, um, developments? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that happened in Great Britain was that people were losing faith in Christianity. You know, Christianity had, had an intellectual grip on the culture of, you know, at least Europe for a long time. And that was fading fast at that point. So you are right. With, with uh, I mean, a lot of this happened before World War I, but with World War I, of course, you get, you know, people who are you know, disenfranchised with the churches who said go and fight, and then there was mass slaughter, uh, really, you know, carnage on a scale that we can't really imagine and don't want to even think about in today's education, uh, which, you know, wars make people think about death and they make them want to come in contact with their, uh, you know, the people who were killed, their sons or whatever. So this sort of fuels spiritualism. But, and so that might... That might be a part of the reason why you do later on get a lot of different different movements, such as Wicca. Uh, I mean, Wicca, I would say, you know, it's also kind of nature-based, so it's a rejection of modernity in a certain sense, uh, or at least that's what it was originally. You know, get back to nature, nudity, uh, this kind of thing. So, but yeah, so I don't know if there's any one thing, but I think you know the the. the decline of the intellectual grip of Christianity is it uh, is a big reason whether that's really specific to that particular moment in time but then certainly yeah the uh, World War one for sure which changed everything but uh, yeah I mean the, the Golden Dawn goes back earlier than that as does the OTO I mean I think I think if you look at um, the trajectory of uh, occultism from the say mid 19th century through the 20th century you do get this sort of trajectory where people are saying, well, you know, G G Christianity must be true because all of these other religions have a bit of it. All of these other myths kind of point to Christianity. So you can take a bit from ancient Egyptian myth, you know, Osiris, and you can take a bit from somewhere else and you kind of get Christianity. So, and their argument would be, well, it kind of, they kind of guessed a little bit of Christianity, which is the true religion. And then later on you get, well, actually, you know, all of these religions are kind of true and Christianity is just one of them and then sort of later on you kind of get this fusion of all these religions together so it kind of props up spirituality so there's not one thing we believe in but there's kind of all of them are true and they must be hinting at something that transcends them so you know Alistair Crowley for example wrote 
a book called 777, which is correspondences. And so, you know, you could, I mean, I haven't read it in decades, but, you know, so he would tell you what Thor goes on this particular tree of life, or, or Thor is, Thor corresponds to another god in another relig religion, so, um, to, to Vulcan or something like that. And then, or, you know, so all of these religions kind of, fused together as a kind of almost like a sort of one world religion, but they become a myth that it just explains there must be something transcendent beyond them. But yeah, I think the loss of Christianity and, uh, and, and war. We have another question. Um, I just have a question in the photographs with yeah. Crowley and Royce, the yeah. fourth one over was a Muslim man, perhaps a Sufi. Oh, yeah. You didn't mention him. I was yeah, wondering, sorry, who, I didn't who mention is him. he and what role did he play in all of this? Yeah, right. so he, he, uh, his name at birth was Henry William Quilliam. Maybe I can go back there. So I don't know if you can see, but yes. right on your right, you can see a man in a turban, uh, very fancily dressed, has a beard and some kind of jewels. Uh, he's Henry William Quilliam. Uh, later, Abdul, Abdul Quilliam. Um, so as I, I mentioned, the Swedenborgian right, of which Roos, founder of the OTO, co-founder, uh, was, he was given a charter for the Swedenborgian right. Uh, William Wynne Westcott of the Golden Dawn was also uh, highly placed in the Swedenborgian right. And Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam was also a member of the Swedenborgian right. Uh, why is he important, uh, at least important enough to be up there? He's sort of, he's not an occultist, but he's in this world of fringe masonry. Uh, he's important because he was one of the first converts to Islam in Great Britain. Uh, and it was actually made by the Ottoman Empire. He was made the Sheikh al-Islam for Great Britain. Uh, there weren't very many Muslims in Great Britain at the time. It's probably about 50. But even so, uh, he had you know, fair, a fair amount of uh, political prestige. Uh, what's interesting to me about Quilliam is that, you know, he would write in the newspapers defending Muslims and the reputation of Muslims and advocating for them and for rights for Muslims under the British Empire and was a, you know, regular, normal, orthodox Sunni Muslim to all accounts. But in private, he was a, a member of the Swedenborgian right. Again, uh, Swedenborgian right is based on the, uh, the, the revelations or the work of Emmanuel Swedenborg, a Christian mystic uh, who claimed to have visions of angels who taught him the, the real meaning of the Bible, every passage of the Bible. And he also formed uh, an order called the Ancient Order of Zuzimites, which sounds like something from Monty Python, but wasn't. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it was ever very large, but it was an order that, uh, that was fundamentally based on Freemasonry, and even in his writings about the Zuzimites, he would say that we are friendly with the Freemasons. And, um, you know, again, you have these degrees, some of which are clearly based on Freemasonry. Uh, the, the, their mythology, uh, we have the Hiramic legend. Uh, they had an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian mythology of Osiris and Isis, but, uh, but it had been kind of secularized, so it wasn't... Osiris the god, it was Captain Osiris, and it wasn't Isis the goddess, it was Isis the virgin truth. And then Set or Typhon kidnapped Isis and put her in a well, and then Captain Osiris rescued the virgin truth and was able to marry her as a reward. And that seems like a very peculiar kind of mythology. And I think it's you know, partly because he's a Muslim, so he can't be worshipping pagan gods. That's the sin of shirk, according to Islam, or polytheism. Uh, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but it's a sort of curious, curious episode in fringe masonry that you have the Sheikh al-Islam for Great Britain um, involved in the Swedenborgian rite and founding his own fringe Masonic order. Um, you know, people in Great Britain think of Freemasonry as Oh, it's for, you know, getting on in life and, you know, corrupt politicians join there, this kind of thing. But, uh, but, I mean, it's patently ridiculous because nobody would join the Swedenborgian, right? A tiny, tiny fringe, weird offshoot of Freemasonry that 
probably 99.9% .9 of Freemasons in Britain didn't even know existed at the time. And you would only join that if you were interested in the esoteric. I, I would point out that, you know, Emmanuel Swedenborg's um, claim that angels visited him and gave him the real meaning of uh, the Bible is weirdly similar to Muhammad saying that he was vis visited by the angel Gabriel who gave him the Quran. And one thing that's curious about the Swedenborgian, right, is that it did attract so many, or it, maybe not so many, but it attracted some influential figures, uh, Quilliam, uh, Westcott, and um, another figure is uh, um, René Gaynon, who is known for um, founding the school of traditionalism, a sort of anti-modernist, um, anti-modernist spiritual intellectual tradition. Uh, and he too, like William, he converted to Islam. So I think that's kind of curious, but to answer your question. We have one more question. Right, I was told by... I was told by high-ranking OPO members that formerly there was co-recognition between OTO 7th degree and 32nd degree Masons. What's the story behind that? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe there were some Masons who recognized them, but I've never heard of that. And um, I mean, it probably, if, if I had to guess, it probably goes back to the Detroit episode where Crowley was trying to make the OTO a regular Masonic rite that you would take after the Scottish rite. But I mean, well, let's put it this way. I'm sure that Scottish Rite Masons recognized the Ordo Templi Orientis, but I'm sure that they weren't regular uh, Scottish Rite. There's all kinds of you know, fringe Scottish Rite and fringe Masonic groups out there. Um, so, you know, it's very plausible that they would have recognized it. Eric, I thought a little bit further. The Matic Order of Golden Door Dawn is still in existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you were to venture to think about what kind of person would be interested in those kinds of organizations, would they be mostly Freemasons who want to be on the fringe a little bit? Yeah. Or are they more of an exotic, territory yeah. kind of personality? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's uh, a range. Angel, can you restate the question? Because that didn't make the video. Sorry? Uh, the video did not hear the question. Was not a microphone. Oh, Just okay. restate the question. Yeah. Okay. So, so the question was, um, what kind of person would be interested in joining the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn or the um, or the Martinist Order or something like that today? And you know, honestly, I think uh, I think there's a range, uh, and I think it ranges from you know people that are eccentric and interested in the the occult and want to get you know superpowers to people who are interested in history and I mean, the, the Golden Dawn originally was populated by, you know, remarkable figures, including the, the poet laureate W.B. Yeats, you know. So it's a fascinating group originally. So I think that, you know, I think there's a range from the eccentric all the way, all the way through on the other side to Freemasons. I mean, this is pretty typical. Freemasons who want to explore the mysteries or the occult or, or go a bit deeper than Freemasonry. So typically when you... In my experience, from what I've seen, typically when a Freemason uh, joins a, a non-Masonic esoteric order, it's going to be uh, the order of Martinism, some Martinist order, there are a few of them, or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in one of its offshoots. It's going to be probably those two, not, not so much the OTO or anything like that. And probably, be, I mean, I guess because the Golden Dawn and Martinism, they do focus more on the light where some other orders, such as the Fraternitas Saturni, focus more on the dark, so that tends not to attract Freemasons. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, just, uh, just a real quick question. Uh, first of all, thank you for this lecture. Fascinating. Uh, very, very lucky to be able to live in a city where we can get these kinds of lectures. Um, I really enjoy Aleister Crowley's writings, especially Book of Thoth. Uh, he added the K to magic. In your studies, did you find anybody else using that K as well uh, throughout the years? Uh, well, only people that are sort of connected to Crowley's, you know, system or, or, or since, since Crowley who want to say that they're sort of serious and, you know, add a K to it to make it sound 
like it's not stage magic, but uh, it's not it's not old English or anything like that. If that's what you're asking, yeah, it's modern. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the answer. Lost.